realities of global surgery uh, pulling together or pulling apart. The, the, just as a disclaimer, uh, maybe is the fact that um, uh, global surgery perhaps appears differently depending on where you look at it. Um, and um, but it is, I think, an important uh, place to just be able to meet and look at what's going on, uh, what we can do together, and uh, where we need to be um, to get the results that we all desire. I live and work at AIC Kijabe Hospital. I'm on um, th that is Kijabe Hospital at the uh, escarpment of the Great Rift Valley. We're about five kilometers above the bottom of the Rift Valley. Uh, what you see down there, the uh, shrubs, uh, sort of brown. And then above us is another five kilometers that will take you to the top of the of the uh, rift uh, of the escarpment. And we're up about 3,000 uh, meters above sea level. Um, so it's fairly high. Um, so we'll quickly go through, you know, what is global surgery um, and then figure out what global surgery advocates may be agreed on and what we're not agreed on, and then uh, the interface between what global surgery and low and middle income countries, and then just touch a little on research capacity in surgical in in sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, I'll talk a little about uh, each research. So, what is global surgery? It is a very clear entity for those uh, that come from high income settings. But um, talking to someone from uh, low uh, middle income settings, the uh, definition becomes very uh, blurry. Uh, the textbook uh, description would be a study and, dis and practice of improving access to timely and quality and affordable surgical care for all. Uh, just uh, before I came to the US um, three weeks ago, uh, one of my residents asked, uh, I, I had so and so has a master's degree in global surgery. What is that? And my response would be, it is uh, what we do uh, every day. Now, the, the truth is, um, if you uh, recall uh, the activities around 2015, the publications therein, there is an urgent need to address the global surgical burden uh, of disease. Um, and that we are agreed on. Uh, we are also agreed on uh, the fact that global surgery should contribute to the elimination of poverty, uh, which would be uh, strategic development goal one. Uh, we're agreed that uh, uh, global surgery should ensure good health and well-being, promote decent work and economic growth, reduce inequalities uh, through uh, improved economic productivity uh, because of good health and reduced uh, disabilities. What we uh, do not seem to agree on is who is responsible for tackling um, uh, the uh, global burden of surgical disease. Um, is it the worker? Is it the government? Um, uh, how should it be tackled? Where do you start? Uh, what skills are required to tackle this disease? And, and then you have this uh, uh, rather ethical dis uh, discussion between task uh, shifting, which I will uh, um, discuss briefly, where uh, I see no boundaries. Uh, in, in what uh, someone who's taken over some tasks uh, will do. Uh, so like a non-physician, uh, non-surgeon uh, undertaking an appendectomy, for example. So who is the custodian? Who is ultimately responsible uh, for that patient care? And then there is a, a task sharing, which works as long as responsibilities and boundaries are clear. Uh, uh, and in this case, the person undertaking the task is taught and trained uh, and appropriately skilled. Um, the truth is it's taken us 40 years to get this far down. And I think we're fooling ourselves. If we can, uh, if we think that we can change things in months, uh, it's taken uh, um, completely uh, ignoring uh, surgery from about 1978 to date uh, well, to at least 2015, uh, to create the uh, disaster that is uh, global surgery today. So uh, we need to strategize on how we 
uh, deal with that burden. And, and, and therefore, you know, what strategy should we take? What skills are needed? Uh, who should be uh, undertaking them? I like to um, use this example of uh, task shifting, and I, I know not everybody would agree, but if you think about how expensive it is and how, uh, how much time you require to train a pilot to uh, take on a Jumbo, uh, uh, as opposed to the training it requires, uh, one requires to drive uh, a matatu, which is a public uh, means of transport in Kenya, then um, you know, task shifting is asking this driver of the matatu to, because it's, you know, there are lots of them, some are jobless, uh, and uh, you know they they drive things so put them on a plane and um, you know just show them what to do um, of a, a week or two and let them fly I'm not certain how many of us would get onto that plane and I think that is task shifting uh, the other things that we don't agree on is timelines um, what do we expect of uh, global surgery um, uh, uh, development, uh, growth, uh, and by when. Uh, I understand the complexities uh, of the differences in um, um, landscape uh, between different uh, countries and, and even continents. And then we don't, we haven't agreed on any standardized metrics. Uh, what is success? Um, is it evidence of declining burden? Is it outcomes? Um, now, granular data is often very different from modeling. Uh, I think an excellent example would be a COVID-19 pandemic. And so a lot of we, what we know about uh, global surgery comes from modeling. And as important as that is, uh, when are we going to start seeing some granular data? What has global surgery achieved in eight years? Uh, just coming from Africa, I think two important things to point out would be one, the Ethiopian uh, experience with uh, scaling up surgery. Uh, they, theirs was a SALT model. They started pre-2015. And because of direct government involvement and engagement and interest, uh, uh, surgical scale up continues to be a success story in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, in 2018, uh, Rwanda, uh, um, the, the president, launched their a surgical uh, plan. And uh, we've seen quite a bit of success in that country as well, because there's been a direct involvement, interest, and input from uh, government. In most other places, uh, global surgery has grown careers through academic advancement with publications and academic degrees, like the one I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, academic centers have grown, uh, programs that offer global surgery opportunities in high-income countries are very popular, uh, even when those trainees may never participate in global surgical uh, ventures. And then there's a, a growth in the whole, uh, in the hotel industry through the multiple meetings that we have held in hotel settings on global surgery. Uh, looking at the growth in publications, uh, if you look at the first 20 years, there's uh, just a blip between 1959 and 79, and that has grown over decades uh, to the point where the last five years prior to 2015, um, there's quite uh, uh, there's quite a bar there, uh, and then from 2015, uh, really an exponential growth in the number of uh, publications through the years with an apparent leveling off from 2021. Um, there was a boom of, uh, um, I think, uh, publications during COVID uh, in all fields. But uh, the concerning thing is the apparent plateauing of uh, global surgery. If, if you just go into PubMed and uh, without any filters, throw in global surgery, uh, this is what you get. Uh, and the question is then, why the plateauing? We'll come back to this later. Uh, when you look at the uh, global surgery landscape, you see a lot of disconnect and siloship. Uh, the uh, patient and, their co and the communities in which they live uh, have a, a, live in a completely different world silo with regards to decision-making and access to healthcare. 
you have a disconnect with LMIC surgeons and the surgical ecosystem uh, with uh, different hospitals and even surgeons disconnected from one another. And then amongst international global surgery advocates, you, find, um, you may find people interested in the same surgical pathology working in the same region, in the same city, but uh, with no prior conversation across the board. And so um, expenditure, funding, et cetera, uh, um, is uh, undertaken without uh, cognizance of the fact that other people are around the neighborhood and perhaps uh, synergizing uh, the, 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 the opportunities would give global surgery a much uh, better uh, outcome. And then you've got international and national regulatory bodies that have all the guidelines required to uh, run healthcare systems, run surgery but those are completely disconnected from what is happening or not happening at the ground. And so we have these silos and are completely disconnected. Um, we'll come back to that later again. Uh, if you think of uh, strategic uh, development goal three, as they have the drives, the spokes that are the other SDGs, uh, because you need a healthy nation to do anything, then surgery is the center of that hub because surgery drives the rest of healthcare. If you grow surgery, you grow healthcare. And uh, uh, looking at uh, what that might look like in a low and middle income country, uh, think of uh, universal health coverage as a, a birth child of uh, SDG. Um, and, and then in order to meet uh, universal health coverage, then uh, and, uh, national scale up uh, plans uh, become important uh, uh, contributors to the process of growing universal health coverage and meeting that. Central to uh, scale up plans and delivery of health uh, care is the training of medical specialists and the availability within uh, those ecosystems. And, and, and these are guidelines that have been developed in many countries, uh, but then the process of moving on to then um, uh, actualizing uh, sustainable development goals uh, continues to be uh, a problem. Uh, this is the only city that I know of, capital city in the world that has a game park within its environments, uh, environment. So a five minute drive from the center, downtown Nairobi will bring you to this uh, beautiful game park where you can take a rest and just relax from the noisy streets. And so we come back to um, this pamphlet that looks at universal health coverage and the ability of uh, nations to uh, provide, governments to provide it. Um, I, I think an important question at this point is, does my government have the information it needs to make the right decisions about the whole system? In order to uh, respond to that question, then uh, data comes from research. And again, we'll be looking at that. Do we have systems? Absolutely. Do they work? Of course they do. Look at this uh, guidelines here. Now, do they deliver the desired outcomes? And um, that is a difficult question to uh, answer. And so let's take a small rest and just view uh, Mount uh, Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in, 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 in Africa. This is a place that we come frequently with uh, global surgery uh, resident, uh, residents rotating in our facility, just for them to be able to one, uh, interact with the community that is far flung from healthcare systems, but also see the beauty of uh, our country and the wildlife. Surgery for most of us just happens. We see a patient in a clinic, uh, we book them for surgery, we operate on them, follow them in clinic, discharge them, and uh, frequently publish a paper. Um, for some people, surgery comes quickly. Um, for many, it is too late. And surgery for many will never come. And so how did we come to the place where we are? And uh, I, I've got to 
state that the answer is complex and the history is a little difficult to consider, uh, but many would 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 take it courageously head on and 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 try to address it. So I, I think if you do a, a root cause analysis, um, one must consider the effects of uh, colonialism and uh, the global health status in low and middle income countries. And then I think uh, the other big place that you settle on is the Almata Declaration of 1978, which um, emerged as a major milestone of the 20th century in the field of public health, identifying primary health care as the key to the attainment of goal uh, for all by the year 2000. However, surgery was excluded from primary health as uh, being too expensive and unachievable and uh, therefore excluded from uh, primary health. As much as this has been taken away, so to speak, the tag remains because uh, a reasonable thought would be even with the inclusion of surgery uh, now in, in, uh, as a primary healthcare undertaking, it requires an infrastructure that requires governments to uh, fund and plan and budget. And with only almost uh, uh, full budgets and with huge uh, debts, it becomes difficult to add something new to an already uh, shrinking uh, budgetary allocation. And therefore, uh, for this reason, surgery remains uh, um, largely ignored. Uh, I think mentorship is important in uh, in uh, surgery, in healthcare, and I privilege. I've, I had the privilege of uh, Dr. Louis Carter as my the late Louis Carter as, my, uh, as a mentor. Uh, he uh, spent many years between ninety five and twenty eighteen just visiting with me between six months, six weeks and three months at a time, uh, growing uh, my practice, take, helping with patient care and uh, helping with the tools of the trade. I work at a, at a, a faith-based organization. And so in providing a service, the, the considerations, the tensions that we work with are how do we make sure it is affordable and therefore accessible, that it is of good quality and is timely, and that it is sustainable, uh, as well as compassionate for those that are vulnerable. Um, so universal health coverage requires that the vulnerable uh, are met at their points of need. The surgical ecosystem could be thought of um, in three uh, uh, places that work together. You think of a pre-hospital uh, situation where uh, Patients come from communities and families. Uh, These uh, patients will have uh, belief systems that affect their uh, health-seeking behavior. And, uh, uh, but their health-seeking behavior is also affected by the referral systems that exist or do not exist, transport, and then healthcare financing. Within the hospital, uh, surgery, the performance of surgery is dependent on uh, the infrastructure, availability of supplies, water, electricity, sewage, finance, human resource. A human resource is a product of education, training, and research um, in the various uh, healthcare providing facilities. And so it is a, a complex ecosystem, and yet with this, within this complexity, it is possible to identify our own strengths, our own resources, figure out how we can contribute to that ecosystem and plan for commitment, invest time, create relationships and create trust, which is what breaks those silos. Um, a lack of system strengthening creates and propagates a culture of dependence and, and really uh, creates uh, the, um, a, 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 uh, uh, solution for politicians uh, because they do not have to invest in a system to uh, undertake the care, uh, the surgical care of their um, 
country, men and women. Uh, the lack of ethics uh, has been, uh, the, the lack of health resources has been cited as an encouragement for students to go and operate in these undeserved areas. And some have argued that some surgery is better than none. What that suggests is the same as we did discuss before. It's basically task shifting, uh, which unfortunately teaches students that uh, patients have different values. The patients at home in healthcare, high income settings where uh, the students may not undertake certain uh, procedures because they lack the proficiency and yet on the ground in uh, uh, during global surgery uh, ventures uh, those patients are accessible to them even with their uh, limited proficiency what that does create is the value systems uh, that become implicit and will affect um, uh, student uh, uh, as they grow through uh, and process uh, global uh, surgical ventures. And therefore, an organized approach to trainee development will help protect elective trainees from uh, operating beyond their level of competence in international electives. Uh, we'll uh, not run into ethical ethics of global surgery research where you find uh, academic-driven research produced uh, whose literature and origin is low and middle income, but authorship is totally high income. Um, fortunately, we're seeing some changes uh, in that, and we look forward to the day uh, when uh, research is completely ethical. Uh, personal experiences for students make uh, them better advocates for equity, and uh, they're more likely to uh, uh, venture and volunteer in future, even as uh, attendings. Uh, uh, Dr. Super was a uh, lead uh, author in uh, Delphi Process that was published uh, not too long ago, Academic Global Surgical Competencies. And uh, I, we worked on a curriculum based on uh, those competencies. And therefore this would be an evidence-based uh, curriculum that um, borrows heavily from the surgical competencies that were published not too long ago. And they, they include uh, the, the, they include the six core uh, competencies required by the ACGME. Uh, we are trialing it out with uh, uh, Vanderbilt and hoping that uh, suddenly for plastic surgery, uh, this would be able to rope in a lot more programs. Um, and enrich the experience of global surgery uh, trainees as they visit uh, low and middle income settings. Now, why should you be involved? There's a lot more work uh, to go around, but not enough people. Uh, nothing is too small and nothing is too big. And so in global surgery, everyone has something to contribute. Everybody has something to give and certainly something to receive. I, I made this statement, it's taken us 40 years to create the disaster that we're in. And uh, we need to take time to build systems that will carry global surgery solutions into the next uh, century and beyond. Um, I think one of the most important um, things that would undergird uh, sustainability in the long term is the creation of a research culture within uh, low and middle income countries. Because research, we agree, provides data that drives policy and in turn builds systems. In the absence, in the presence of a, a siloed uh, system and in the absence of uh, systems that work from top down, what we need to do is develop systems that work from bottom uh, up and be able to integrate with whatever uh, systems exist uh, in, in uh, our countries. So building research capacity means building a culture, supporting education, training, and research output. Uh, the African, we, we will want to change uh, research publications from Africa between 2010 and 14 contributed to less than 0.5% of global publications. Um, South to South collaboration was at less than 5%, whereas uh, between uh, that between African 
researchers and the West was more than 40 percent. Uh, that uh, those statistics, amongst others, uh, led uh, me and a, a few friends of mine to set up a nonprofit. Uh, we call ourselves Each Research, uh, which stands for Enabling Africa Clinical Health Research, uh, which uh, trains surgery trainees uh, on clinical research. Our goal is to develop a critical mass of surgeons with research skills. Uh, we struggle with access to quality journals, a place to publish uh, at no cost. Uh, uh, we are able to at least uh, take care of referencing software and so statistical analysis, uh, analytic software, uh, because this, uh, there are those that are open source and therefore available. Um, in order to address a number of these uh, uh, problems and uh, mm -hmm. With research as the uh, uh, as the primary building block, um, we have thought and worked through uh, the development of uh, the Qatar Institute for Excellence in Plastic Surgery. Um, our focus is plastic surgery because that is who I am, but the research would be for an entire surgical uh, fraternity, where we think we would construct a, a, a place. Uh, the property has actually already been been purchased and is available. It would be an independent uh, institute that is able to bring people together, uh, get them a simulation, train them, use uh, adjacent hospital for the clinical work, and rather than transferring trainees to um, you know out of Africa, out of country, uh, being able to 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 bring in trainers to this central place. Uh, transfer uh, skills, and then that that becomes um, a, a lifesaver because we also reduce the cost of training. The other bit that we look to is creating an Afrocentric uh, research um, environment where we identify our own problems, we uh, begin working on them, and we invite funding for the specific uh, problems that we think would be a solution to our problems. The current uh, environment is such that uh, the uh, funding bodies determine the research that is to be carried out, say, in Africa. And, and, and therefore, in the end, you end up with a, a, a data that uh, is useful for the funders, but not necessarily the immediate of immediate need to the place where it is being produced. And so we'd like to see a change to that. And we're hoping that if we can establish systems uh, in our institute, that people will come along and work with us. In order to uh, cut down the silos, we would like to be a logistic uh, center that is able to connect people from different places, different experiences, bring, bring them together, create trust between them and let them run with whatever programs they'd love to. Um, and so that that is what we desire to be. And uh, if we, uh, in a few years, are able to show a sustainable model, then our hope is that uh, a scale up would come where uh, similar facilities can be built across um, Sub-Saharan Africa, South, West, and gradually perhaps even uh, in country. Um, this is uh, what the property looks out to. Uh, and uh, at night, and, and so, you know, really beautiful. And uh, so our thinking is that with uh, breaking down those silos, we can create an environment of trust and being able to share uh, resources, including finances, so that we uh, provide what we all desire to uh, provide. And uh, uh, we are grateful for a nonprofit uh, ConnectMed International that uh, is giving us uh, support in uh, at least establishing this uh, project and building it. And so uh, we're hopeful that in a few years, we'll be able to uh, make a report of our first steps at actually providing uh, training in this site. Um, thank you very much. And I invite questions. <laughs>